Hello everyone, this is Brian with Cost of Crypto. Welcome to episode 29. It's been a while since we've recorded, there's a lot to cover, so let's get started. Since the last time anything was published, at least as far as audio goes and podcast, a lot has changed. Back in March, we were looking at Russia and Ukraine and how just the month prior, we had the story with the Canadian truckers and how that was a live use case for Bitcoin being presented directly in front of us in Russia and Ukraine and how that presents being a use case for Bitcoin directly in front of us. We went from that to a general decline in the market price and the unwinding of a lot of financial chicanery that has been in place when times were good over the last two years. So let's get into it. March, April, going into May, things were holding out well. If you looked at the price of Bitcoin, Bitcoin was holding out in the 30,000 range to 40,000 range, bouncing around. And then the decline began and the sell-off was hard. The general crypto market, as far as prices go, the sell-off was hard. There was rumblings with legislation, uh, in the United States as far as trying to give definition or trying to give agencies some sort of working parameters, which is still in process as of today's recording, give them some parameters to work with and definition for cryptocurrencies, how it would play into the larger picture. Talk of central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, uh, there was still hope and promise with NFT art, Web3, all of that. With the general decline in prices, where we're seeing Bitcoin down 70-80% from where it was at its highs, we're seeing other projects down even more so. That's changed the game and the landscape completely. We saw that with the collapse of Terra and its Luna coin. That was a, an algorithm stable coin. It was one that the theory was good, but the incentives to maintain that peg ended up being abused in arbitrage. And that brought down, or that started a cascade effect because then in this month, this past month, June, we saw a lot of lending protocols and a lot of lending platforms, centralized lending platforms, Celsius, BlockFi, uh, Three Arrows Capital was more of an investment fund, BlockFi more so as an investment fund, Galaxy Digital as a lending fund and an investment platform. We're see and several others, we're seeing this decline where the necessity of maintaining high prices, the necessity of maintaining valuations of assets at higher prices was leading to an unwinding of leverage. And it was leading to margin calls. These margin calls being you have a position where you borrow against the valuation, or you borrow against something based on the valuation. And what you have is when the valuation drops, you're forced to post more collateral. Well, if you don't have that collateral or your liquidity is stretched thin, you're going to have to start selling. You have to liquidate funds to come up with that liquidity to close out your positions. And that's what happened. You had a massive unwind, which created selling pressure, which dropped asset prices further, which just created a death spiral. And now we're at a point where we've discovered, and I'll put links in the show notes, and I've shared them 
on the Sunday summary posts, very good links and short videos that talk about what happened with Luna, but also what happened with what happened with the unwind of the lending platforms, how, where and how they allocated funds ended up leading to margin calls and position unwinds, putting things in staked ETH, which essentially is a representative token for Ethereum on a one-to-one basis that would be unlocked once Ethereum's merge took place and they completely transitioned from a proof of work valid block creation to proof of stake model plus some buffer time. Uh, We're seeing how positions in that. We're seeing how a lot of positions that were based on other firms and their positions led to an unwinding. The three ROs capital, which just two days ago, the news broke of how they were essentially being pushed into bankruptcy and liquidation and how that affected BlockFi, how that affected, I don't know, recall if Celsius had exposure, but there are several other prominent firms, uh, Galaxy Digital, and how these firms were exposed to the naked gambling, essentially, that Three Arrows Capital was involved in. We're seeing a lot. If we, if February and March brought about use cases for Bitcoin, May and June brought about use cases for understanding risk understanding third party risk, understanding systemic risk, understanding having your coins in the custody of lend of third party platforms. And I think a lot of Bitcoin maxis, I understand them a little bit better now. Or before it was just a little bit more of tribal in nature where Bitcoin's better than pick a protocol because of XYZ. It's better than Ethereum because it's this. It's better than Luna because of that. Fill in the blank. And what we have right now is a situation where it's very characteristics of being decentralized, of not being backed by anything, of being a protocol where you self-custody the coins if you so choose where if you hold it you own it that's illustrating itself very well right now and the use case of using bitcoin as a hedge of risk not only from the financial system not only from fiat currency devaluation and manipulation monetary system manipulation but also third party risk where if you own the bitcoin that's it you don't have to worry about any third party risk whereas if you loan out your bitcoin to other companies you're in a situation where you're assuming additional risk it's a simple case of not your keys not your crypto It's just like a regular bank where when you deposit your money in that bank, you no longer own that money. That money is the legal property of the bank and you are an unsecured creditor, meaning you are an IOU on their books. And when you say, hey, I'm withdrawing any amount, 60 bucks from an ATM or $6,000 from an account, you're essentially drawing on those IOUs and the banks are pulling out of their reserve funds to cover that. The same risks do apply with lending platforms. You give them your crypto, it's no longer your crypto. They can make guarantees and they can say we're gonna cover it, they can say we have insurance, 
but that may not be the case. With Celsius, I always felt a certain degree of uncertainty. A, a friend of mine who has some of his crypto on there because it had uh, very attractive yields for the lending side. <clears throat> he told me that was the platform he used and I put a little bit of myself, full disclosure, into Abra, which I watched that thing like a hawk and so far it's passing the litmus test. But don't use my own experience or observations as a final decision. Only use it as a data marker. If you're thinking about, hey, should I give put any money into crypto lending on Abra, do your own research, assess your own risks, don't invest stuff you can't afford to lose. Simple rules. If you can't follow those rules, then anything you lose, if you lose something, that's on you. But taking a step back, with Celsius, I had considered, because he had a, uh, a referral link where I could get an incentive bonus, but there was just something that didn't quite sit right with Celsius, something I couldn't put my finger on. And the fact that there was no disclosure about why Prime Trust had canceled their working relationship with Celsius made me even more suspicious. And pretty much everything was speculation. It was a lot like if you go back to the 2017 cycle with a lot of ICOs, with a lot of high yield investment programs, high ups, and BitConnect, where something just, it felt a certain way, but you couldn't put your finger on it. You couldn't put anything tangible on it. Well, that was sort of how I felt with Celsius. Well, we come to find out, it turns out, in order to generate those yields, they had put, oh, I think I'd heard somewhere like around 30% of their funds into DeFi protocols. That came into a situation where, because the decrease in prices started causing essentially bank runs, more or less, and they did not have the capital to be able to cover their losses or over collateralize, over, over collateralize their assets and be able to cover their position. And then left them in a situation where they were scrambling to try and plug holes in the dam wherever they could, but it was too late. The damage was done. And hence why the withdrawals were halted because they needed to maintain whatever funds they could. And honestly, I do believe he, Alex, he has the best intentions at heart, that he is trying to revolutionize finance, that he is trying to maintain the value, the full value of people's funds in Celsius. But they're in a situation where they're kind of caught in a corner. And as John Malden would say, there are no good choices. So now we're in a spot with Celsius where they have legal teams advising them on what to do. Their assets, their books are, we've heard rumors that FTX could possibly take a bid for them. We've heard, I think there was a rumor that maybe it was Citigroup or it might have been JP Morgan was looking possibly getting their assets at a discount. And we've already seen on a related note BlockFi apparently closed a deal with FTX where not only did they get an extra line of liquidity, but there is an open option as of recording date for FTX to acquire them at a certain valuation. Uh, I think given if certain metrics or goal, goal marks are hidden, probably if they can prove themselves, it'll be at an acquisition at a certain price. So if you have an account at BlockFi, your information, all your private KYC data that you have uh, shared with them could become the property of FTX now. Some people are critical of uh, Sam Bankman Fried, Friedman and how he's essentially turning into JP Morgan too. Or sorry, JP Morgan the second. And it's like FTX, I think, is the investment vehicle and the indirect puppet of a lot of money in traditional finance and through FTX 
they're going to have a greater degree of influence and control. Back in the 2017 cycle, 2017 cycle, it was the digital currency group that all the traditional money was working through all since that time. A lot of money, billions of dollars, have been invested in firms, FTX, Crypto.com, BlockFi, numerous others. And now, through FTX, they're picking up distressed assets at a discount because they have liquidity behind them to acquire them, which means that's the Wall Street money. They're channeling, it's being channeled through FTX. So, you see FTX doing something, look at it with an eye of skepticism because the greater interest of the space may not be the ultimate intention. It might just be acquisition, control, and financial scrape, earning money off fees. Wherever money flows through it, putting a scooper in there and diverting it into their, into people's pockets. So I don't currently have the highest opinion of the FTX organization. It might be a great platform to trade on, but as far as the organization itself as a financial entity, no, don't trust them one bit. Related note, some time ago, I think it was after Luna, I did, I had a little bit of uh, Bitcoin from 2020 that I put into block by just to kind of try them out. I withdrew that and now it's just using the credit card, which, I mean, it's a great way. If you want to start stacking stats, one and a half percent interest or one and a half percent paid in refund and rebates paid in Bitcoin. So, I mean, that's it, that's one way to stack sats. But if you don't want the possibility of dealing with FTX and how your information and data could become financialized, avoid it altogether. I know Abra is going to be starting up a credit card this year, but it's with Federal or uh, American Express. And as far as I'm aware, American Express doesn't have as much retail exposure so you won't be able to use it as many places as you would the BlockFi Visa card. Although you could always use um, the Fold card which is a prepaid debit card. The only issue with that is that you have to continually fund it and your rewards aren't always consistent because you can either take a point, a flat 0.25% for everyday expenditures, or you can spin their chance wheel where it could be anywhere from a quarter percent to one percent to four percent to a full Bitcoin, which happens from time to time. But then again, if you're looking for just gift cards for like, say, uh, Home Depot, Domino's Pizza, Amazon, you can get three percent, four percent, five percent rebates in addition to the flat quarter point or spin the wheel. So I mean the fold cards definitely, without going into detail here, uh, a decent option too. However, Black is 1.5%, flat rate, easy peasy. So trade-offs. But we're seeing a lot of unwinding of risk. We're seeing a lot of systemic risks being exposed and people are learning who was going out in the water without any pants on because now the water's receded and we're seeing who was naked a lot of protocols out there and then add to this all the pressures financial downsides people and institutions being squeezed it's forcing it's creating pressures on lawmakers to put their foot on the pedals and speed up the process of legal definition. In Washington, D.C., we're seeing legislation that has been presented and is going through. I think there's two bills moving in parallel to each other. There was a bill that... There were recently hearings, and I totally think it was staged, because 
it was a sh it was on one week's notice they brought in charles hoskinson and several other people who were very well spoken for the space And the way it framed, because I listened to Coin Bureau's play-by-play -play of it, it sounds like it was a very deliberately staged hearing with the idea or with the end goal of trying to have the definition and the, I guess you could say the structure of a protocol falling under the jurisdiction of the CFTC, the, oh gosh, the, the, the full entity name's escaping me, but essentially Bitcoin would be regulated as a commodity. The tokens of protocols would be regulated as commodities or money versus the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, which would be more involved with the projects, the organizations behind a protocol itself. So like with Cardano, IOHK, um, with Ethereum, the Ethereum Foundation, anything that has a team that promotes and changes code, affects the protocol, there, the SEC's jurisdiction would be more about the disclosures and the information involved. CFTC be more about the digital tokens, which I think given my druthers, I'd rather fall into the CFTC, but we still need disclosure. We still need more disclosure. If we had better disclosure, where whether it was government mandated, industry mandated like uh, underwriter laboratories where it's essentially self-regulation by industries as far as certain standards go or a blend of the two we would know up front before we put our money in the celsius in the block fi uh in any other send fi lending protocols or lending platforms this is how the money these are the risks this is what they put their your funds into this is how they invest them this is where they generate the income to pay for the yield we would know as disclosures up front versus the cloudy oh hey trust us well trust us doesn't work anymore we've seen that i think if anything we do need this clarity. When I think about myself, one of the things I finally started doing starting last year was a weekly dollar cost average. If you're not familiar with the concept, the idea is you invest a certain amount of money on a consistent basis, whether it's every year, usually, or every six months, every month, every two weeks, every week, I do it weekly. And the idea is that when the price runs up, you're not buying too much in the highs. And when the price goes down, you're taking advantage of the cheaper price to buy more. And the idea of it is over time, the highs and the lows average out and you get a happy medium. Well, I've been doing that with Bitcoin and I've been also doing that, putting aside a little bit of extra money for other tokens. Uh, for me, I've been a fan of Ethereum, Cardano, and then also Chainlink. Because these are protocols that I see potential in. However, where we are now and how the landscape has changed, I want to know what the legal definitions are and the parameters affecting these tokens, affecting these protocols. Because until I know what that is, the way the definitions are, that could completely change how someone would invest in these or how much of a total portfolio or weekly investment a person would put into it. Because maybe there's a higher degree of risk. Maybe there's different taxes involved. Maybe there's different 
information disclosure on KYC stuff. We don't know yet. So with the market and the prices and the environment where it's at, I've stopped purchasing those tokens altogether. And it's that that equivalent value is going into Bitcoin because that's the one surefire thing we have out there. There's no question about the protocol. It's not going to change next week. It's a very ossified and solidified protocol where its characteristics, they're very well defined. And as I alluded to earlier, if you hold that Bitcoin, no one's going to take it from you. You've eliminated the third party risk. The only risk you have are other vectors such as are you protecting your private keys? What kind of a device is your wallet on? And listening to a recent what Bitcoin did, uh, Matt O'Dell was on there. And one thing he brought up that I was not aware of was how Ledger, your Ledger Nanos, the software that they use, uh, Ledger Live, that is something that they run. And if you start using the services on there, like say you can do lending on there, but the problem is, is that you have to submit KYC info for that. And right there, there's a point of vulnerability, a point of disclosure, a trail to follow and find out and learn about what crypto you own. And it creates that trail. Ledger runs their own nodes for each protocol to update the Ledger Live price info. And that right there, those are points of vulnerability as far as privacy, where someone, if they have the right tools, could trace back your Bitcoin to a wallet that you have on your Ledger Nano and then trace it back to you. So there's risks with that. I mean, when the water receded, there it was more than just who was overextended and who had leverage. We're learning in very short order about risks with crypto. And a lot of everyday average people who don't have an in-depth knowledge of it, they're learning this as well. So uh, a lot of pain, but a lot of good coming out of it. So yeah, a lot has changed in the landscape in the last three months and it's been uh, very swift and very dramatic if you haven't been through a bear market before but you have conviction I would say stick at it if anything now's a great time for dollar cost averaging because the last cycle around when the prices came back down to the five thousand dollar range Because that $5,000 price level was an upside target back in 2017 when it was under 5000 I remember the talk during the summer was, will Bitcoin hit 5000 And saying Bitcoin hitting 5000 would be like saying Bitcoin hitting 100000 today. It could, but I uh, just don't know. You just don't know. But if there's anything that I've seen, and I'm sharing this just to help you get perspective, is that Bitcoin's history has been, every time there's been an upside swing, the bottom of the downside that followed was always higher than the previous time around. And that's because we are on a global scale increase in adoption, awareness, implementation. And I think this sort of cycle, not a four year cycle based on the happening, but a psychological cycle of adoption and the number of people in the space and how the price moves up in a corresponding manner to the overall level of adoption. 
that has been a consistent even before I was deep in the weeds. And based on that, times like this, when there's a bear market and there's a negative psychology and there's a lot of washout and a lot of protocols and genuine shit coins are getting blown out as they should be. For a protocol like Bitcoin, which is when you throw in the legal factors, the safest of them all, the most conservative, this is the time to accumulate. This is the time to do that dollar cost average and just stick to it. The uh, I often use the phrase of a proverb. The best time to plant a tree was 15 years ago. The second best time is today. If you start today, it doesn't matter what it is. $50, $5, $1 a week. It doesn't matter. If you just invest $5... Let's say you can scrape together 10 bucks, just 10 bucks a week. At the end of the year, you will have accumulated $520 worth of purchases and whatever, however much Bitcoin, let's say Bitcoin, however much Bitcoin that would purchase, which puts you ahead of the game by $520 versus if you had to scrape together 520 bucks to buy the equivalent amount. Plus you have the issue of timing and how much Bitcoin that single purchase of 520 bucks would get you. So that's one of the values also of dollar cost averaging. You're only getting a little bit in, but over time that accumulates and that puts you that much further ahead of where you would have been if you just tried to save for larger dollar amounts. So do that dollar cost average, definitely. This isn't financial advice. But it's where I put my money. It's where I put my money. Put your money where your mouth is. Well, I am. So it's bear markets like these that it helps to do your research, understand what you're investing into, understand the protocol, understand the ins and outs of it, and acting accordingly as you so choose. So that's enough of that. Side notes, GPUs are cheaper, graphics cards. This was something because I'd been eyeballing, my own little story, I'd been eyeballing uh, upgrading from a 2060 that I got, sorry, 2070 that I got in 2019 and upgrading that to a 3080 Ti. Those things are running, gosh, a year ago. Those are running $2,800, not cheap. And then over the last few months, especially when the bear was hitting hard after Terra Luna's collapse and then this past month, with crypto prices going down, a lot of miners, I just remember 2018 and how a lot of people who bought video cards in 2021 or even 2022, all of a sudden, they don't have the conviction or the understanding of the depth of mind or the wallets deep enough to just hang in there and mine and they panic sell and they go on the market they go on eBay secondary markets and they start selling their cards and a lot of larger scale miners are doing that as well where the profitability on top of ethereum moving to a proof of stake it's once ethereum does that mining the profitability on other protocols drops by a third i've looked at say like zcash or ravencoin or even ethereum classic and when you consider what they currently bring in today in mining profits plus the amount of spillover hash rate from ethereum that's not coming from asics but just gpus Switching over to those protocols, the difficulty will increase probably very noticeably, and the returns of whatever you currently were earning, that'll take a further decrease. So it's really not, not that profitable uh, to be mining these coins. If you're mining them, it's because you're not doing it for a profit today. It's because you want to accumulate 
and build up your bag and that it, you'll be doing so and making info. So that's been the motivation for following prices. And today, a 3080 Ti is down to like eight, nine hundred dollars. So it's gone down significantly. And I've noticed that too with Bitcoin ASIC miners. What would go for fifteen thousand dollars in a secondary market is down also too as far as age goes too. Uh, and like an S19J, that is down. I think just like maybe three, four weeks ago, seven, eight thousand dollars. Now you can get them for under six, depending on where you're shopping around. So, I mean, the, the demand's dropping off, the hash rate's dropping off, and you're seeing in like your Craigslists and other listing places, people selling entire mining rigs. And if you're looking for a video card just to have for your computer because you like gaming or you do some sort of video or graphics, perfect time to be shopping around. If you're looking to upgrade a card, perfect time. If you're looking to accumulate crypto, you have a better entry, entry point, but you have to consider what the profitability is going to be going forward. If you're looking to mine Bitcoin, that's a different story altogether because the Bitcoin hash rate is just growing. It's growing. Go up. So if you're looking for a Bitcoin miner, an ASIC miner, now is the time to do your math, sharpen your pencils and figure out, is it worth it? Especially with the electricity costs, because you're going to have to put in a good dollar to, you know, a few thousand dollars to get a decent ASIC miner and also pay double digit sums of money each month in electricity, but you're going to earn or you're going to accumulate a good deal of Bitcoin in the process, though, at a fixed cost, too, because the electricity prices don't fluctuate. You're going to have a fixed cost. So the price goes up, the price goes down. The more the price goes up, the greater that discount is that you're able to acquire Bitcoin at and KYC free on top of it, depending on you know how you hook up your uh, service to a pool, if you use a pool. So that's another thing. If you're looking at mining, now's a good time to start looking at things and figuring out, is it worth it? I suppose there's plenty more we can go into, but those are the main points. So, appreciate you sticking around if you've made it this long, especially. You can follow The Cost of Crypto on numerous social media platforms and video sites listed in the show notes. And with that, be well, everyone. Talk to you soon.